Okay, I think we are live. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Ward. I'm the editor of Popular Science Magazine, and uh, we are. Uh, this is our first Google Hangout. And we thought it would be an interesting thing to sort of experiment uh, with it by uh, playing with this. Our first, uh, the, the the big conversation that uh, our new comments policy has uh, created. Um, I have been talking about it with a lot of people. Uh, we obviously talked about it a great deal internally. And then uh, since uh, we uh, came to that decision and changed it, man, I've been talking everywhere. I've gone on the New York Times, you know, New York Times, BBC. I mean, it's been really pretty endless. Uh, and uh, and kind of, I mean, it's, it's been really great, really, uh, that I'm just thrilled that people are sort of taking such an interest in it. It was obviously not an easy decision. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking about it uh, with you here. So um, just a little housekeeping um, in case you have not done this before. Uh, there's a Q&A button off to the left there. And if you uh, if the uh, questions aren't already popping up on, on the right, then uh, that's how you'll see them. Uh, and you can post questions there. Um, I've got uh, a couple of them sort of uh, queued up here just to get us going. But uh, you're welcome to toss them in as you go. And I'll, I'll just uh, address them as best I can. So. Um, uh, the first question I'll, I'll take here is uh, Kevin Kelleher asks, uh, uh, hello, can you explain your thought process as you weighed the costs and benefits of keeping the comment section? So obviously this was the big thing, right? What what are the, the good and bad things of, of, about doing this? Um, obviously comments have played a tremendous role in um, the internet in general and um, even before internet comments, right? Discussion among scientists was one of the cornerstones of science and remains one of the cornerstones of science. So. Um, we took it very seriously, the idea that we were going to, you know, be doing away with that. But what led us to this decision were three factors. The first was um, a question of, you know, just bad behavior, right? Uh, the rise of, of sort of unpleasantness and uncivil behavior in uh, chat rooms uh, is well known to all of us, I'm sure. And the um, uh, that sort of rising tide of unpleasantness was just getting tougher and tougher to handle. Um, that wouldn't have been such a big deal um, if it weren't for factor number two, which is a growing sense, um, both a growing body of research um, uh, and our own experience, um, that uh, there is there can be really negative effects when it comes to uh, science in particular um, around uh, uh, that kind of unpleasant behavior in comments. Um, that the uncivil discourse can be really, uh, uh, you know, can can create really polarizing, a sense of a real polarization among uh, readers. Um, there's also pretty alarming stuff about how um, there's a, a, a couple of studies we looked at, uh, one in particular that had to do with um, basically there's the sense that people are beginning to conflate what they read in the comments with what they read in the article. So um, we'd be writing, you know, a, a story, let's say, about uh, contraception and someone would write down below a thing about how uh, venereal diseases are not, in fact, prevented by condoms and, uh, you know, really misleading information, uh, factually incorrect and, in our view, sort of dangerous. And then three, um, we just discovered that, you know, I mean, obviously, there's a way to handle that. We could moderate it ourselves. We could maybe appoint, um, uh, you know, an, uh, our audience to help moderate. There's all kinds of ways we could have gone about it. But we just didn't have the resources to handle that. We've got a really lean staff of uh, news editors. And so it just came down to, you know, if we can't do this responsibly, if we can't moderate it ourselves, um, then we just felt like it was too, the, the stakes are too high when it comes to talking about um, science uh, for us to uh, just sort of let comments be utterly unchecked. And that was really the only thing that we had uh, because we just didn't have the resources to control them properly. So it was those three things rising tide of unpleasantness, higher and higher stakes as to what that unpleasantness sort of can cause, and limited resources. So that's what it came down to. Um, uh, then Amelia Mueller asks here, uh, how do you think anonymity versus identity impacts community growth online? This is a great question. I mean, our system, uh, such as it was, uh, was an anonymous commenting system. And um, I, you know, have found uh, and I think a lot of my colleagues in publishing have found that anonymous comments really can lead to, um, they, they let people sort of get away with saying anything they like. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of publishers have decided to do away with anonymity in comments uh, because it seems to uh, encourage at least slightly more civil discourse when people are, are standing underneath their own names. 
Uh, the Huffington Post has done away with an anonymous comments. You now have to be logged in to do it. Um, Facebook commenting obviously could have been a solution for us. That's one way to do it. But Facebook commenting also creates all kinds of other headaches that um, I can get into if you're interested. Um, but there was sort of granular sort of site design stuff that we were looking at where um, it made it uh, very difficult to go with Facebook. Um, so uh, in my view, I mean, one of the reasons that we're, um, we've decided to sort of move the conversation off of our site and to Facebook and Twitter is that um, people tend to be themselves and not uh, operate under such anonymous handles uh, in those mediums. Social media can, you know, is a little bit more of a personal conversation, a little bit less of a sort of open forum where people just kind of put whatever they want under whatever name they want. So um, I think that uh, being able to put, you know, if we could inject identity into this conversation, it would probably help. Again, though, we just didn't have the resources to do it. So. Let's see, on a larger scale, Abby Bouchon asks, uh, on a larger scale, what are your thoughts on the future of online comments in the next five years? Do you think new levels of civility and collaboration could emerge? Um, I am, uh, I mean, I'm bullish on comments in general. I mean, I will say that I consider comments to be something of a vestige of the pre-social media world, right? Before Facebook and Twitter, there were comments. And, you know, it was a ploy in a way. I mean, they're, they're very cool and they have a great effect, but um, they were uh, a ploy in a way to get f more traffic. You know, it was a way to sort of encourage people to um, post and then check back on their posts and, and you know, get uh, sort of as much as they, uh, you know, it, it was a way of sort of drawing you in and trying to keep you on site and it drove you know, up uniques and page views and time on site. Then along comes social media, which helped, I think, to fill uh, a lot of the role that comments have traditionally played. Um, people chatting back and forth in all kinds of, of ways. And, and what I like about um, something like Facebook or Twitter is that it's a little bit less of a broadcast medium, right? You're, you're following your friends, you're following people you're interested in. Um, and as a result, there's a, a little, it's a little more sort of um, the, the, the circle is a little more selective, not, not in terms of like exclusivity, but it's just, you know, in terms of relevance, people are, are subscribing to you because they want to hear your thoughts on a particular idea and you subscribe to other people because you want to hear their thoughts. Um, and so, uh, you know, that I think can have, you know, if we could build that kind of um, circle almost system into comments, I think that's really good. I think that there are some very cool and interesting experiments going on in publishing right now uh, around comments. I think Kinja, which is uh, Gawker's system, is very interesting and useful. Um, I would point out that io9, uh, one of our competitors, uh, but they're also friends of ours, um, uh, you know, has a really thriving comment system over there, but they also very, you know, put a lot of time and a lot of money into building that Kinja system. It was a couple of years, a couple of million dollars. We didn't have a couple of years and a couple of million dollars. You know, we had to deal with this situation right now, so it wasn't really perfect. Uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, it was, a, it was, we did the best with what we had, I guess. Um, I'm also a big fan of Medium, uh, which uh, many of you may know, uh, right, uh, Ep Williams, the newly, the guy who's just about to be so rich uh, based on his Twitter stock. Uh, is um, created this this new sort of platform for writing and commenting, and there's all kinds of annotation, you know, margin kind of uh, writing that you can do there. So I think as the technology gets more sophisticated, it's going to be great. That said, right, the great challenge with moderating comments is no piece of technology is ever going to be able to pick up every uh, moment of of you know any, every abusive thing, right? You can flag for keywords all you like, but um, you know, it's always, it, you know, I think for the next five years or so, it's going to take humans uh, getting involved to sort of uh, uh, handle this stuff. And so it's always going to be a really heavy burden for a staff as small as mine. So um, let's see, Jackie Powell, a, a colleague of mine, is, is posting questions that were posed uh, before we began this uh, uh, um, broadcast here. And she sends one in here from Jonathan Lowe. Um, do you feel that the lack of comments will force apart scientists and the average person toward further standpoint extremes where events and discoveries uh, will be turned into two-sentence two did-you-knows? Um, I hope I'm not misconstruing your question here, Jonathan. I think uh, that I understand it. Um, that, that will comments force apart scientists and the average person? I mean, to me, a, a, a magazine like Popular Science um, uh, you know, is a translator, right? We're not a peer-reviewed journal. Um, we are a, uh, a magazine, you know, that is, is sort of, you know, scouring the world of science, right? Trying to establish what it is, you know, we, we cover established uh, scientific consensus and emerging scientific consensus and everything else that's, that's going on in the world of science. And we, we translate it for a lay reader. 
Um, you know, we are not uh, like Nature or Science or other peer-reviewed journals whose purpose is for scientists communi to communicate with one another. So, you know, I, I would say that our um, uh, doing away with comments uh, on our site, I hope, isn't going to drive apart um, the average people and scientists. I mean, I think that, that one thing about put it, pushing um, uh, conversation out into the Twitter sphere, right, or out into Facebook is that, um, at least on Twitter, you can find a lot of these scientists, right? They're in that conversation already. Um, you can reference them in tweets that you might post about our stories um, and stand a pretty good chance of them seeing that and coming back to you. I mean, if anything, the conversation is widening by going out into social media. And so um, I don't think, you know, for us, it, it was a, a question of, um, purpose, right? If, if the primary editorial mission of popular science is to produce great science journalism, right, translate it for uh, our readership, which is totally what we, you know, that's our, that's our number one goal. Um, if, if hosting comments on the site were to begin to actually, you know, work against that, and that was the point which, that we felt we had reached, um, then, you know, it's our responsibility to try and come up with a better solution. And so I think that by pushing uh, that kind of conversation out into social media, suddenly you've got the whole world involved. You can talk to all kinds of people. You can reach uh, those scientists on Twitter for the most part. And so um, I hope it doesn't drive them apart. Uh, we'll certainly reconsider it if we get the sense that it is. But so far, I don't get that impression. So, um, Jackie has now also uh, posted another question here uh, from Mark O'Connell. By challenging the perceived reigning theories, we can find new info. By stopping comments, don't you think you contribute to not challenging long-held science views and so inhibit new discoveries? This is a great question, and Mark, I, I appreciate you asking this. Um, I think that you know, the 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 challenge with a magazine like ours is well, I, I mean, again, the primary purpose of a magazine like ours is um, to popularize science, right? We're not a magazine uh, in which scientists debut their findings, right? No one's going to get tenure for their, sh their work showing up in, in popular science. Um, instead, we are a, a, a magazine for average people who are uh, intellectually curious and want to know what the future holds, right? So it doesn't feel to me like we were built to be a forum in which um, people are going to sort of challenge science, right? Or that we're going to sort of discover you know, sort of make grand discoveries in the comment sections of, of our uh, magazine. Um, you know, we are very much, like I say, you know, uh, uh, sort of scouring the world of science, translating it, and bringing it to our readers as best we can. Um, you know, if we were to build ourselves as a sort of system for challenging scientific doctrine, um, we would have to go about it very, very differently. You know, we would have to um, be creating all kinds of, of uh, uh, sort of alternate systems, we would have to have a very, very different readership, very different editorial mission. And so I don't think um, our primary purpose is to be a forum for that kind of thing. Our primary purpose is to uh, put out news about science as best we can. So um, there are other, however, uh, uh, outlets in which I think some very interesting work along those lines, along the lines of what you're describing there, Mark, um, is working. There's one called uh, Pub Peer. God, I think I, I think I've got that right. I'm sort of deer in the headlines here, but I think it's pub peer. What they've done is created a system in which they're trying to tr challenge the traditional peer-reviewed journal idea, right? That Nature and Science and the others follow, um, where you know a, an editorial board at one of those magazines um, uh, reviews the work and you know considers it good enough to to you know publish. Uh, instead, they're trying to you know open source that peer review process, challenge that doctrine. Um, but what they've done to do that is building a community of scientists, trained scientists. And I you know I have the utmost respect and esteem for our readership. I love our readers, and I think that uh, you know some of the greatest pride I have in in our readership is um, uh, the DIY and maker community stuff that we see. I mean, people make ama you know people who are not otherwise trained engineers uh, build amazing things. Um, that said, I do think that hard science requires real training. I think that it, uh, you have to be qualified to be um, a part of that, uh, you know, part of the actual science conversation. I don't consider myself qualified to be part of that conversation. I feel I feel qualified to run a staff uh, that includes some scientists and includes a lot of really great journalists uh, and to translate for uh, a, a lay audience, but. You know, I don't feel qualified to to be a scientist myself, or to say to somebody, you know, actually, I don't believe that your findings are correct. I'm not that guy. Um, and so, to me, it doesn't feel appropriate for uh, me to treat our readers uh, in in that same way. We just don't have, uh, uh, you know, we're not built 
uh, to do that. I think that PubPeer and other uh, initiatives like that have a, stand a great chance of upending uh, traditional ways of doing that, but um, it feels to me like uh, that's not our role. Uh, let's see. Greg Johnson says, um, uh, uh, do you think some sort of automatic comment monitoring system might be possible in the near future? Um, I think that uh, comment monitoring certainly for abusive comments uh, is uh, possible. Um, you know, I mean, you can flag all kinds of keywords. There's turns of phrase you can discover. You know, you can weed out spam. There's all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but I do think that there are certain places where um, you know, a human is going to have to get in there and, and moderate. And I think they should. Um, I would point out that um, our, uh, you know, an innovation uh, that, that was unrelated to our no comments policy on the news feed, um, but uh, just happens to have come out around the same time, is that we've debuted this new blog network. It's 13 different bloggers. Um, and the trick there is, or the advantage for us there is, each one of those bloggers then acts as moderator. Um, pardon me, somebody's calling me. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm not taking that call right now. Uh, you can wait, PR person. Um, the uh, uh, comments that um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, I, there are uh, 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 systems. Oh, sorry, the bloggers. Right, my bad. Uh, blogger network uh, uh, bloggers are going to have the um, uh, discretion to turn on comments for individual posts wherever they think that constructive conversation can happen. I'm all for that. I mean, that's that's what we're really excited about that um, because it means that we've got the resources that we didn't have otherwise. We've got the individual bloggers actively moderating their stuff, and I think any successful uh, uh, writer online right now, as long as they have the bandwidth to actively engage with the, the comments that come in under their their stuff, that can work. Um, but when you have a staff of six, like we do, putting out 15, 20 posts a day, and those posts then stand as a sort of a reference point for all time, right? It might be the defining. Uh, we had a, a story about tribology that became like the web's number one source of information on tribology. Um, that sort of, you know, it's like two years old. For us to track comments that are two years old for that staff of six to do that, it's really, really hard. So I, it's very difficult for uh, an automatic system to capture every little thing that might come up in this, but I think that uh, that it is possible. Um, Number five, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Kevin Falvey and five other people are asking, uh, Jacob, if you were granted the resources to monitor and police comments, uh, then would you reinstate them? I, I hate the word police, Kevin, although I, I understand exactly what you mean. Uh, we are not the police, um, but moderate comments. Yeah, to monitor and moderate comments, would I reinstate them? If I were given endless resources, I think that I would. I think that there is a way to do that. Um, I think that it would require um, a big paid staff of humans I think it would require a pretty grand uh, 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 redesign of our site and redesign of our back end to support that. Um, I think I would take a look at something like Kinja. I think I would take a look at something like Medium. Um, I think those are can be really, really interesting places uh, to do it. I, I feel like I would want to work the kinks out in um, uh, just to, to, to sort of understand uh, the, the, you know, uh, the way that our audience wants to talk to us. Um, through a, uh, a you know subjects like DIY and, and hacks, right? I think that there can be a huge you know just a, a blooming garden of uh, of in, you know interesting information and really fun community that can grow up around a subject like that. Um, you know the then when you get into um, uh, you know places where people have sort of more deep personal feelings about. Uh, Climate change, or abortion, or evolution, or any of the other subjects that we discovered, you know, have a, like a, we're just getting a lot of, of very unpleasant comments. Um, then, you know, I'd, I'd, we'd sort of have to take a look at that. But yeah, given endless resources, absolutely, we would we would take a look at it again. Um, let's see. Connor Swenson asks, Have you ever had a constructive conversation via comments? And if so, are there certain elements or qualities of those conversations that set them apart from the rest? You know, I mean, yes, absolutely. I've had constructive conversations where in comments, I, you know, I've, I would say that there were, you know, there have been times when our readership has really done a, a tremendous job of, of holding forth on, on some really interesting stuff. Um, I was really, really proud uh, to be uh, part of the readership uh, when uh, we posted this no comments policy on Facebook. We suddenly, I mean, within an hour, we had uh, over 200 comments of people back, you know, talking through. Uh, the pros and cons, and and being extremely civil with one another. Um, to me, I think that 
uh, posting under your own name, and especially in a context like Facebook, where you know people post pictures of their own children and of their spouses and of you know whoever uh, you know th things and people that are important to them. I think that, I think their identity is bound up in Facebook in a lot, a lot of ways, and so I think they tend not to be abusive toward others in that sort of environment. Um, and so I found that that I, I do believe that that uh, anonymity can really be an enemy of civility in this case, and so I really like like that idea. Um, but um, uh, you know, I, I also think that you know, uh, there are, like I said, I've seen communities grow up around other, you know, around writers. Certain corners of the web have a tremendous amount of, of uh, great conversation. With us, um, you know, we have a pretty big audience, and so it's not the same cast of characters coming back a lot. It's a, you know, it's a lot of strangers moving through, and so um, I, you know, feel like, uh, it, it, you know, the more repeat. Uh, customers, we can, you know, the more repeat uh, readers we can draw in, and that's on us, we have to do that. Um, and the better that we can help sort of tie them to their own identities, I think that the better that's going to get. Um, let's see here. Christian Scher asks, would you consider a conversation system between only one reader and the author instead of between readers, like the QA session here? That's really interesting. I mean, our um, readers, sorry, our authors. Um, uh, Oftentimes, post you know their their email addresses, and so it's very very easy for you to do that. I mean, that's I know that's not quite the system that you have in mind, right? Emailing somebody, but um, uh, we do we do imagine that. I do. I mean, I really like the idea of bringing writers in for uh, Q and A's like what we're doing right now. I think this can be a really uh, useful way of doing it. Um, so uh, uh, to me, I think that uh, yeah, that is possible. You know, but again, it's a it's a matter of bandwidth. I mean, we you know the 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 writers that we employ. Um, the editors that we employ, they do a lot of work. You know, they go from, you know, they, they you know, might be doing three stories on space in a day. And so it's, it's going to be difficult for that person to have a satisfying conversation back and forth with people. So comments, I think, you know, serve that function in many ways. But um, uh, I would consider it. I'd think about it, sure. Um, let's see here. Jackie's asking, a, a, posing a question from Twitter. Is it inevitable that minority protagonists of frustration and discontent are foreclosing forums of public contribution? All right. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that people who are uh, uh, frustrated and discontented are they foreclosing forms of public contribution? I mean, I think that that it is inevitable, right? That the the that people who yell the loudest get the most attention, right? And are most upset about stuff are going to you know write about it in the most shrill terms, or are going to sort of get the most the most attention as a result, sort of have an influence on the conversation. I mean, that's what this. Uh, uh, research that we cited in um, our post uh, announcing the no comments policy uh, has found that when people um, are really, really shrill, uh, they tend to um, uh, create the impression that this conversation is incredibly fractious or that there's a, you know, it tends to drive people apart. I mean, that definitely, that, you know, um, a comment uh, system is, is pretty, uh, I don't know that I, I'm sort of saying this off the top of my head, and I don't know that I believe it, but I'll road test the idea with you that. You know, perhaps a comment system is is only as good as its uh, most unpleasant member, right? I mean, a, a conversation is only as good as, as uh, uh, you know the, the person who says the meanest thing, right? So um, I do think it's inevitable that those people will have an outsized influence on the conversation and comments. But um, I also, you know, I like to to um, uh, imagine anyway that there's going to be uh, a way for us all to have a real give and take and uh, and really really uh, learn from one another through something like comments. Um, Michael Dexter asks, um, what happens when an article published on PopSite is not accurate? For example, there was an article published about waste to energy um, that was pure speculative criticism. So I looked deeper and found that the author was wrong. Please reference my posted question. Okay, I'm referencing your posted question, Michael. And um, when an article published on PopSite is not accurate, I mean, well, I would say that that is, uh, I mean, that's my nightmare, right? That's what I, that's like when, when something is inaccurate. When we, um, uh, you know, get it wrong, um, you know, there's hell to pay. I mean, we, we, you know, that's that's when you get chewed out in my office. And so, uh, we work incredibly hard and hold ourselves to very, very high standards, or we try to, uh, when it comes to the accuracy of our articles. Um, you know, we are undergoing a shift right now where, um, sort of, there's going to be a kind of opinion section. Um, uh, you know, the blog network ends up being more about opinion and analysis, and that I think is going to be a much, you know, 
a place where people are going to sort of be, you know, post sort of broader stuff. They're going to speculate. They're going to chat about stuff. You know, it's going to be a much sort of looser environment. Um, but the news feed, right, needs to hold itself to the same kind of standard that that everybody else does. And so we work really hard on that. Um, to me, the um, you know, I think you'll notice that when we do get it wrong, when there is uh, something inaccurate, we post a correction really quickly. Uh, we and, and we don't just change it. We we show you exactly, you know, as is the standard in, in uh, online. Um, you know, we we change things around and and let you know exactly what we got wrong. So. Uh, we try to, to be as truthful about that, as we, you know, as, as honest as we can about that, and as transparent as we can. Um, Twitter, I think, and Facebook are going to be great places for that to happen. And again, you know, our authors, for the by and large, are, are uh, posting their emails on these uh, pieces. So it's it's you know, in this day and age, it's really hard to be inaccurate online and not hear about it. And anytime we hear about it, we're correcting it. So. Um, Let's see, Taylor, Taylor Walker asks, do you see models elsewhere online that you would like to replicate for discussion around pop site content? And if not, what would your ideal comment section look like? Oh, Taylor, boy, I wish I knew what an ideal comment section would look like. I like Medium's um, section. I think that, you know, their, their idea of, of annotating parts of a story and having, a, and having these sort of branched conversations come out from those parts of the story, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, so to me, I like the idea um, uh, of a sort of, you know, a slightly more rigorous, not just sort of 30,000 foot critique of an article, but here's the part I disagree with. Um, this really should be a different way, or, you know, um, uh, there's an interesting piece of research that you guys didn't mention, or whatever it is. I think that, that really uh, the more that the technology and the more that the format can support a dig into uh, the, the guts of the article and, and less about just saying, this was good or this was bad, you know, that's just sort of doesn't end up inspiring as much constructive conversation, it seems to me. Uh, Victor asks, uh, you said we are not a peer-reviewed journal and we are a magazine for the layman. Don't you think that uh, this is precisely why comments are important? Comments are a way to point out misunderstandings of the author to help the layman from being misled. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I take your point, right? Comments are a way to point out misunderstandings of the author to help the layman from being misled. Sure, I can understand that. Um, I would point out, though, that it's not that we are, um, you know, the, these are not... Um, you know, these are not off-the-cuff things we're posting, right? These are reported articles. Uh, we hold ourselves to a really high standard, as I mentioned, and so um, you know, the idea that we would sort of that the author misunderstands and has misled uh, the the um, uh, reader, um, the comments are not the only thing keeping that from happening. Uh, we work extremely hard to be uh, as accurate as we possibly can, and when we're not, we correct ourselves. So. Um, it doesn't feel to me like comments have to be there in order for you to do great work that way. I think that um, you know you can look across uh, uh, very very lofty examples in publishing. The New York Times uh, very rare, you know has only a few articles in every edition that you can make comments on uh, because again they you know they have a mechanism for being as accurate as they possibly can. We try to we've also tried to build that sort of mechanism. And so um, to me um, uh, uh, you know we are. Uh, going to get an incredible amount of feedback from social media. We always have, we always will, not always, but you know, we always have since it's been invented. Um, but uh, you know, in the time of social media, it's become an incredible tool for us. And so, again, I, I want to emphasize that this is not us trying to do away with feedback from our readership. It's just our our choice is not to post it under the article in question. Instead, we are trying to give people the opportunity to talk about it as much as they can, just not right on the site. You know, there's that whole line of buttons you can post each one of our stories any one of a million different ways. You can get back to us by email. There's all kinds of ways to have that conversation with us. It's just that uh, we're not going to post it right in the article because uh, we, we're trying to you know, hold the site to a, a certain standard and we just don't think we can impose that standard uh, every place, you know, throughout every article uh, uh, from here to two years ago. So. Um, Thomas Groth asks, uh, is there really a need to be concerned that serious people would actually be misled by comments by some anonymous person? So Thomas, you are, you are, uh, you are way ahead of me here, buddy. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I would say that 98% of uh, the people that read our stuff uh, are, are you know, not going to be misled. You know, there's no, um, uh, you know, there's no way that you, you can, uh, uh, you know, we're not assuming that everybody is going to be somehow misled by people. Um, but we try to write for everybody, and we take it very, very seriously, the idea that, that our magazine and our site and every other thing that we put out needs to be absolutely comprehensible to everybody. So uh, my wife and I have a, uh, uh, 
have children, and, and if you ever go on the uh, parenting sites, not parenting.com, but um, any of the baby sites, um, they'll say, um, you know, you'll see somebody have posted a, a thing that's scary and inaccurate. They'll say, oh, it's okay to put a baby on their on their tummy. I do it. It's all it's no big deal. And if you look into the research, you'll see that actually putting your you know baby, your baby to sleep on their stomach is the most one of the most interesting things you can do for them. You know, that leads to, to sudden infant death syndrome. There's all kinds of scary stuff. And in that place, you'll see all the other parents will jump on that person and say, you know, uh, don't listen to this. You know, this is bad advice. And here they're citing articles and doing all the stuff that you guys have uh, rightly pointed out. Um, a good comment section should do. Um, so uh, to me, it's not that you know all of those people are doing that job. We just didn't have the mechanism or the resources to make sure that we were being responsible for that two percent of people who might read that article and think, oh, it is okay for me to put my baby on my stomach. You know, we don't publish those articles, but you know what I'm saying. That kind of of uh, standard is something we have to take seriously as a, as a, such a big publisher. So um, let's see here. Uh, uh, the magazine would like to. Uh, sorry, Eric. Price writes, the magazine would like to push commenting to Facebook and Twitter. And you guys, I'm going to go a little over time here, but I think I'm going to make these the last two questions here. Um, the magazine would like to push commenting to Facebook and Twitter. Yes, I currently don't have those accounts. I'm sorry. So losing comments on pops.com is more painful for me. Would you consider taking difficult topics to Google Hangouts in the future? Sure. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think that um, this is uh, a, a great way for us to uh, talk about all sorts of uh, subjects. Um, there's also, uh, we have a Google Plus page where lots and lots of comments can go. Eric, I noticed that you posted there before uh, the, the session began. Um, so there's going to be the opportunity to, you know, I would say, you know, if you are, are interested in one of our stories and, and want to comment on it, put it on Google Plus. We would, you know, we monitor that all day, all night, you know, so absolutely, that's a great way to get with us. Um, so, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's a, a great suggestion, take, taking topics to Google Hangouts in the future. I think that's absolutely correct. So, so this is going to be the last question. You guys, I really appreciate your time and your attention. It's really kind of you to come out. So um, last one here from Greg Johnson. What do you think of challenging your readers to suggest ideas for a new comment system? Maybe readers could vote on their favorite systems and the most popular could go to a site like GitHub for development and get tested on PopSci one story at a time. Yes. Greg Johnson, you're my hero. That sounds great. Uh, let's do that. Um, why don't we um, figure out a uh, a way to do that? I'll, I'll, let me think about that and sort of how we go about it. I, you know, again, you know, resources are an issue uh, for us. Um, but you know, if GitHub, uh, if the community at GitHub wanted to build us a, a, a functional comment uh, system, that would be great. I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, let me let me think about that one. I'll get back to you. But um, this is why we like discussion, right? This is why it happens. And I'll point out that this didn't happen on our site. You came to me this way. So um, I uh, I really appreciate your time, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out, and uh, I hope you'll um, keep reading us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.